Is what you believe really true? Is it true for everyone or just you? There's a lot of controversy about this, and today we'll begin to find out real truth. Here's Pastor David. Start with verses 1 and 2. Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort. They really want this to happen, okay? This isn't like, hey, guys, would you mind if you just, you know, how we are with people because we don't want to be overbearing, right? Hey, would you just mind if you just, no. We urge, we exhort, we want to see you do this thing. In the Lord Jesus, that you should abound more and more, just as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Okay, he's sort of setting them up here. He's saying, listen, I've just told you about perfection of faith and love and how that's going to work, and now I'm saying, okay, I want you to abound more and more because we're now going to talk about the commandments that we talked to you about that are going to help you learn how to love. He's sort of winding up because he's about to throw a pitch. He's about to throw a pitch, and he isn't throwing over the plate. He's throwing at their head, coming inside, okay? And he knows that, so he's sort of set them up, sort of set them up. And now the pitch is going to be thrown. Let's read verses 3 through 5. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Okay. Now you guys are like, well, yeah, people say that in church all the time. <laughs> Listen, this pitch would have hit them hard. Because the Thessalonians were around a bunch of people. They lived in a place where sexual morality was rampant, where sex was actually worshipped. Okay? That's what they were living with. And so when they heard it, they were like, oh, woo, we don't want to talk about sexual morality. Which, by the way, is probably how some of you feel right now. And I, frankly, I feel that way too. I'd rather talk about something else. Right? Because this is a big issue. We tend to worship sex in the same way that they did, and yet the Lord is saying here he's, he thinks it's necessary to talk to the Thessalonians about this problem, and because it's in here, it means it's necessary to talk to us about it too. The word says to possess your own vessel with sanctification and honor. Your body, right? Possess your body in sanctification and honor. Now, why does God need to remind them to honor their bodies? What, what's that about? Right? Because most of us think that, oh, we think the body's a good thing. We want to take care of it and so on. But there were those then, and there still are now, who looked at the body and, in fact, all physical matter as evil. It's stuff, all the stuff was kind of part of the world. It was kind of evil. So there was like the spiritual, that was the good stuff. And then there was the body and the other stuff that was evil. And because the body was unspiritual and evil, who cares what you did with it? This was prevalent. Who cares what I do with my body? What difference does it make if I'm going to the prostitutes and I'm you know, doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing the other thing? Who cares what I'm doing? Because my body is evil anyway. The only thing that matters is my spiritual self, and that's really not connected to my body. And God is pushing back on this. Lord willing, we'll get more into that philosophy over the next couple weeks. But God is pushing back saying, no, no, no. Your body should be sanctified and honored. Why? Because he made you. Because he made it. Because he said it was very good. Hmm. Maybe it's not pure evil and horrible. But even some Christians started following this mindset. And yet, if God made the body, if you're to be redeemed... You must have had been deemed at some point. Right? Chew on that. All right. Sanctified means holy and free from sin. Okay? He's saying you need to hold your body in sanctification and honor. That's, that's the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's the real deal. And trust me, this was, re, this was new news to these Gentile believers who would come in. This was new news. This was not an easy thing for them to buy into. It goes on. Verse 6 says this. 
that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. That is interesting. God is describing sexual immorality as taking advantage of and defrauding your brother. Sexual immorality is taking advantage of other people. It's defrauding other people. That's what sexual immorality is. That's, that's where the rub is on this. The, the, the sin is causing you to take advantage of and defraud other people. And some of you are thinking, how is that possible? Isn't it victimless? We're going to press more into that next week, Lord willing. So you need to come back. Last little section for today, 7 and 8. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. He who rejects this does not reject man, but God. That's who's being rejected, God. God called us to live in purity, in holiness. That's what he called us to do. For some people, this is the way they interpret that. God called us to not have any fun, right? God called us to be prudish, right? Certainly our coach is going to tell you that when God says you should be holy and pure, that God means you shouldn't have any fun, which I think is a really interesting thing to level against the God who invented sex. He created sex, and we're saying that if you do sex God's way, it's no fun and all the rest of that. Let me just tell you, it is good. He created sex. He created it good. He has a design for it. Not everybody agrees with that design for a lot of reasons, some of which are not their fault, some of which have to do with the way they've, they've been conformed by the world, some of which have to do with a million other things, but God does have a design, and we've got to trust him. That's where the whole sacrificing presenting our bodies as sacrifice, comes in. Sometimes we have to sacrifice that which we want or which we think we want or which we desire in order to honor God because he knows what's best. Now, we're going to dig deeper again, Lord willing, next week in that. Okay? But that last sentence is so big. He who rejects this isn't rejecting man. It's rejecting God. There's a therefore in that sentence, right? For some of you know that I was, I'm a lawyer, and if you, if you guys, do you guys know why blood sucking mosquitoes don't bite lawyers? Professional courtesy. Um. <laughs> I really don't get bitten by them very often, so I don't know. Um, seriously, though, as a lawyer, when I get to the therefore, that means I'm bringing my argument together. That means I'm bringing what I'm trying to say together into one thing, okay? And so when they say, therefore, he who rejects this rejects God... He's bringing an argument together, so let's roll back through the argument really quick. Number one, the commandments about sexual immorality are from the Lord Jesus. You'll find this in verse 4, 2 that we just read. Next, this is the will of God, okay? Sexual morality, abstaining from sexual immorality, is the will of God. Verse 4, 3, if you want to go back and look at it. The Gentiles are sexually immoral, immoral because they do not know God, verse 5, God called us into holiness, not uncleanness. Verse 7, therefore, rejecting the call, the will of God, by not abstaining from sexual immorality, is rejecting God. That's the therefore. That's an argument he's built for you. This is about God and what he says and what he wills and what he's commanded. If you reject it, you are not rejecting me, the messenger. You're not rejecting the Bible. You're not rejecting, you're rejecting God, straight up. And it makes sense because he's created things the way that he wants them to work. Now, it's, it's big for you to get that. So stick that in your heart and your mind. If you reject God's plan and design for sexual morality, if you will not abstain from sexual immorality, you are rejecting God. Now, what does that sound like? Sin, right? Rejecting God is sin. Ultimately, rejecting God and not perfecting faith are both going to always be there whenever there's sin. So why? why? Why do those who don't know God walk in sexual immorality? He says the Gentiles, that's just everybody who's not a Jew, right? 
And in this case, he's really talking about everybody who doesn't know the Lord. Why do they walk in sexual morality? The answer to the question, for those of you who like things to be really simple, is not simple. It goes far beyond lust and self-control and the kinds of things that we try. Well, that person just doesn't have self-control. and uh, Yeah, okay. It's far more complicated than that. The reason is, as we said earlier, that we've been conformed to this world. We've believed a lie about God and who he is. And we've believed a lie about ourselves and who we are. That's why. Ultimately, what drives us to sexual immoral, immoral behavior and all immoral behavior are lies that we believed about God and who he is and us and who we are. That's it. Now we're going to talk about a little bit of that. We're going to get into some dualisms. Dualisms. Now I know I say something with ism at the end of it, and some of you are like, isms, nap time. I know. That's where it is. Listen, stay with me, okay? Dualisms. Why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe what you believe? You believe what you believe because the worldview that you have was largely thrust upon you by so many others, like old philosophers like Plato, Plato, Descartes, these guys and their ideas have had a lot to do with forming that worldview. It hasn't just been, as some people like to think, oh, it's MTV and sitcoms and gangster rap, glamour rock. Cable news, Facebook, look, it's really not those things as much. What those things are doing, the words and actions of those people and institutions that are pushing all of this stuff, they're just repeating old lies in newer forms. That's all they're doing, okay? They didn't come up with this stuff. It's been thrust on them like it's being thrust on you, and they're just acting it out, okay? These ideas are old and serious, okay? And the fact is, is that we have often come to believe in a number of dualisms. And dualisms are just basically things that are separated that aren't necessarily separate. That's all they really are, a dualism. Okay, a dualism. So let's talk about some different dualisms. The fact value dualism is one. Fact value dualism. Secular sacred dualism and mind-body dualism. These three combine to answer the reason why we act in so many ways, but especially when it comes to issues like abortion and sexual immorality and transgenderism and identity issues and things like that. These three work together to put us in a position not only to, to buy into things that are evil, but to not have the, the gumption, the ability, or the understanding to actually fight against those things and help people who are suffering with them. That's what these things do. So let's walk through it, okay? Because every one of these dualisms is a vicious lie that leads to real evil. Ideas have consequences, right? The fact-value dichotomy, simple. There's two kinds of truth. That's what the fact-value dichotomy says. There's, there's a big T truth, that stuff like science and the things in the physical world, like this is big T truth here. This music stand, right? Things we can prove with our five senses, those are big T truth. And for the fact value dualist, these are the only real, the only real truth. They're objectively true no matter what anybody believes. Big T, big T truth, science. Then there are little T truths. Little t truths are things like whether God exists, things like whether justice or love exist, things like whether there's really such a thing as morality, things like religion, and other stuff like that. Those are all little t truths for the fact value dualist. That's what they are, okay? And they would describe those kinds of truths as subjective. They're up to you. Whatever you want to believe, you can believe because they're not really true, right? They're just true for you or false for you. You do you, right? That's true for you, but it's not true for me. Fact, value, dualism. That's what that is. It's been going on forever. You think it's new. It's not new. This is not a 20th, 21st century invention. Fact, value, dualism has been going on. The divide of truth into separate spheres of existence has been going on for a long time. A long, long, long time. Now, if you want to think 
that love is nothing more than the chemical firing of neurons in a human body, fine. For the fact value you do, let's think that. Or if you want to think that love is something much more special and significant than that, fine. For the fact value dualist, believe that. It's for you. Good job. Whatever you want to believe. But if you believe that love is something real and part of the nature of a real God, and you think that those facts are true regardless of what anybody else thinks about it, if that's what you think, you're an enemy of a fact value dualist. You become their enemy. As soon as you break the spell on fact value dualism, you're an enemy, somebody to be dealt with. C.S. Lewis calls Christians fighters. He says it's a fighting religion. He's not talking about, you know, this kind of thing. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, listen, Christ followers are fighters because we reject fact value dualism. That's essentially what he's saying. Look, we say there really is a God. There really is right and wrong. There really is love and justice and morality. And when we do that, we're destroying fact-value dualism. We're saying that all those things are true, whether people believe them or not. You can't just do you. You can do you, but you're going against reality. That's like you doing you by saying there's no gravity and just walking off the end of a building. You do you, but there's going to be a consequence, right? That's what's going to happen. That's why Christians have been persecuted. I want you to think about this. Why have Christians been persecuted? Why did the Romans burn these Christians and throw them to the lions and so on? Because Rome was fact value dualism. I mean, if you really look at it, believe whatever you want. Worship any God you want. Just don't mess with the way the state does business, which was evil. And don't mess with anybody else's religion. Just do the coexist thing, right? And I'm all for coexisting, by the way. You should not use violence or harshness or anything but love to engage with your neighbors, whether they believe something different than you or not, okay? So I'm all for coexisting, but that's not the kind of coexisting the Romans were looking for. They were looking for the kind of coexisting that never came up against their power. And Christians weren't like that because they believed that what they believed was true regardless of what anybody else believed and that the other things that people believed were wrong and there was such a thing as right and wrong and the state had obligations just like everyone else to God. Did not work out well. That's why we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King tomorrow, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And you can contemplate from what you've learned today that the reason that the state And the institutions of racism fought against him is because he was destructive to fact value dualism. Because his ideas were Christian ideas. He is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He was a fighter who said that all men really were created equal. Not, I have this private idea inside my mind, that all men were created equal, but you do you. I'll just go over here and stay out of your way because you need to be able to do you and I need to be able to do me. No, no. All men really were created equal, is what he said. And that the state had an obligation before a real God that there was a power above the state that said what ought to happen. And he stood strong and he fought for that and went to jail and eventually was murdered because he came up against those who want that fact value Dualism. He wouldn't have it. He wouldn't have it. Because he said they were really wrong and he was really right. And righteously so. He was really right. They were really wrong. These are really objective truths. And when you destroy, when you're destructive to the fact value dualism, it will always cause conflict. Always. Always. Because the whole point of fact value dualism is to not have conflict. I get to say what's really, really true. And then what's just true in your mind. And as long as we're all good with that, we're going to get along just fine. As soon as you break out of that, you're going to have a problem. Right? But we reject that. We reject fact value dualism. We refuse to pretend like morality and God and the other things which are the most important things to human lives in this universe are just simply subjective ideas rolling around in the minds of certain people. They're just meaningless and personal. They don't mean anything. Other people may want us to believe that, 
It's not going to happen. So have you found yourself struggling in any of these areas? If so, we'd love to help. Call us at 360-885-9000 or come see us at Axe Church in Vancouver, Washington. Get easy directions at axechurchnw.org. We'd love to help you sort this all out and find the peace and freedom that can only be found in Christ. On the next episode, Pastor David will continue this look at dualisms, and it's a powerful episode that you won't want to miss. Hope to see you right here on Contemplate.